I would encourage you this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, to turn over to Daniel chapter 2. As Carl mentioned, I'm with you for these four weeks. Last week was the first, and this week, and Lord willing, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the first four chapters of Daniel, and uh, uh, not so much looking at Daniel and the prophecy there. That is so intriguing, and it's so much fun. Usually when you get into that, you can't get back out again, because it just gets you, uh, gets you going as far as what's coming. Uh, but we're looking more, though, at the man, Daniel, and his three friends as well, and I've, I've entitled this uh, four weeks, uh, Remaining Faithful to God No Matter What, that we can learn a great deal about who God is in this book of Daniel, but I think it's a, a valid as well to look at the godly Christian character or godly character that Daniel and his three friends here will display for us in these chapters, and so we're more going in that direction than looking at the prophecy, and I know some of you are disappointed because there's a beauty of a prophecy today that we'll be reading about in Daniel chapter 2, uh, but we're not going to dwell on that as much as on uh, the man himself and his three friends and the way that they, they uh, lived in Babylon. You'll remember last week I tried to uh, give you a, a, a very quick bird's eye overview of the Old Testament as a whole and where we're at now here with the book of Daniel. Not to repeat that whole thing, but to remember that God has covenanted with his people Israel, the descendants of Abraham, that he made them into a great nation at Sinai when Moses was active as the meat mediator between God and this nation of Israel. He formed them into a nation with him as their king and they as his people. And he made great promises to them through Abraham and through Moses to care for them, to protect them, to, lie, to guide them and instruct them. However, we find the Old Testament story is tragic in many ways because these people failed to live up to this great legacy that God had given them as, as his people. And they rebelled, they were idolatrous, and as a result of that, God had to discipline them. And we're seeing one of the great times of discipline now as Daniel opens here in these first couple of chapters because God has taken them and exiled them hundreds of miles away from home, destroyed Jerusalem, their capital city, and even more tragically, the temple where God's presence resided. And now they are in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar here in chapter 2 today. Uh, Daniel and his three friends have been taken captive and brought to Babylon. On, and we saw last week that they're in training to serve in the king's court. Remember that? That, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar has appointed for them the very best food. He is training them now in the language and the literature of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And they are living what you might call a pampered life, uh, an elite life. This is not something that most people in Babylon were experiencing. Certainly not these exiles to have this kind of treatment. And we saw last week, this is for the express purpose of bringing bringing this talent from Jerusalem in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, this talent to Babylon and using it for the advancement of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, this is a talent grab here because Daniel and his three friends were told in Daniel chapter 1 are very gifted that they have uh, great knowledge and wisdom, and so uh, Babylon hopes to use them for Babylon's good. And remember, we saw last time as well that not only do they want to be used, uh, uh, Babylon wants to use them, Babylon also wants to assimilate them to win their hearts over so their identity as Israelites fades and their identity as Babylonians grows. We'll talk more about this next week, but we have to remember that, that there's a real pressure on these young men to identify themselves now with Babylon. Remember how we saw one of the major ways that this takes place is by changing their names. Their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, all in Daniel, of course, all with the name of God within their name. And now they've been renamed with Babylonian gods 
in their names. So you can see this pressure is on them to conform to these circumstances that they're in. And uh, I hope that that was meaningful for you last week to talk about how uh, Daniel, uh, M, uh, he, he illustrates here, acting on personal conviction to resist this assimilation effort when he won't eat the king's food because it would defile him. Well, now, this week, we're going to see that things get a little sticky. The drama increases in Daniel chapter 2 because the king has a dream and he seeks for his wise men, including Daniel and his three friends, he seeks for his wise men to help him with this dream to understand it. And it's going to get a little hairy in this chapter for Daniel and the rest of these wise men. So if you've got your Bibles there, first of all, I'm not going to read the whole schmear because there's 49 verses. And I think some of you would fall dead asleep on me if I ran 49 verses in a row. It's just a, a natural instinct. But uh, I'd like to just outline it briefly with you all and then look at it by sections and read them as we go through this. I think there's three main parts to Daniel chapter 2 here this morning. And you can see this if you look at your Bibles. In Daniel 2, first of all, verses 1 through 20. This is where we're confronted with this problem of the king's dream. Nebuchadnezzar's had this dream. He doesn't understand it. And he's looking for help to know what this dream signifies. That's in verses 1 through 23. In verses 24 through 45, this is where the solution comes. Where his dream is interpreted and Daniel is a big part of that in verses 24 through 45. And then there's just a little epilogue at the end in verses 46 through 49 that tells us the result of all of this. Of God being glorified and Daniel being promoted. So we'll look at these three sections one by one here as we move through this this morning. Everybody ready? Got your seatbelt on? Ready to go here this morning? Oh, there's about four of you. How about the rest of you? Is this... There we go. Yeah, We need a little more uh, out of you on that, okay? Why don't we pray, though, and ask the Lord to lead us in our study, and then we'll uh, continue on. Let's pray together. We worship and praise you this morning. Father, thank you that we can sing these songs to you from the heart of your glory and your goodness to us. And the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us and what he continues to do for us and what he will do for us. We thank you, God, that we can gather in your name. We pray now, God, your word would go forth, and I agree with Carl this morning, that it would have its full impact on us. Please, God, give me the words to speak, and I pray that you'd give these people ears to hear. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go through these three parts one by one. Verses 1 through 23, this is the king's dream now, and there's a problem because of what happens. Follow along with me. I'm going to read these 23 verses out loud. You can follow in your Bibles. Don't look at me. Look at your Bibles as I read this. Okay, ready for it? Daniel 2, verses 1 through 23. This is the word of God here now. Verse 1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants and we will declare its interpretation. The king replied to the Chaldeans, The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Well, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we'll declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king 
inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who would declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling pace is not with no mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Arioch, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Arioch, the king's commander, For what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Wow, what a story. Don't you want me to just keep reading it? Forget the message. Let's just read God's words. It's thrilling, isn't it? The vividness of the story and the intense pressure here upon Daniel and these other wise men because of the king's dream. I could talk about a lot of things, but we'd be here until three this afternoon. So let me just highlight a few things for you as you, we look through this. Maybe you didn't notice it, all right? First of all, you need to understand, folks, in the context of the ancient Near East, dreams were very important. They were seen along with other omens as messages from the gods. Remember, these were polytheistic places like Babylon. They believed in many gods. And the gods would communicate in many different ways to humans, especially a king. And one of the ways was through dreams. So this was something to be taken very seriously by Nebuchadnezzar. That from his frame of reference, the gods are trying to communicate to him and he doesn't know what they're trying to tell him. But that's what he has his wise men for. Did you hear all the names for him? Conjurers, diviners, Chaldeans. He assembled this court of wise men to help him interpret, to understand these messages that he would receive from the gods. But it's imperative to interpret it, to understand this, because sometimes if a god was angry, you better find out about that. So this would be of great concern for Nebuchadnezzar. So he calls in help, these diviners. Notice they are not prophets. They don't deliver the message, but they interpret it. Look at these diviners and these wise men, almost like translators. That there is a message given, but it's in a means that's not able to be understood. And so now their job is, through one means or another, to understand and to interpret what that message was. But it's all contingent on the idea of them hearing what the vision was, or understanding what the omen was before they can interpret it. And that's why they get into this thing with Nebuchadnezzar. Well, go ahead and tell us what the dream was, and we'll be happy to interpret it for you. That's our job. So they're, they're connected with the gods. They're able to understand these type of messages. And so God, the gods will speak to the king through dreams like this, but it's the diviners, the wise men, that they, God will show them exactly what it means. 
And we're going to see a little bit later, that's exactly what he does for Daniel as one of these wise men. Okay, so you get the idea? They don't deliver the message, they interpret the message, these wise men. Okay? So then, in verses 4 through 13, this is where the plot gets a little thick, doesn't it? Because they ask Nebuchadnezzar to tell them the dream and they'll interpret it. But it's obvious there's another underlying issue here going on in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Not only does he want to understand what this message is, he also must, for some reason, he has suspicion about the credibility of these wise men. Because he refuses to tell them what the dream was. And as the wise men themselves say, what king has ever asked that of his diviners before? Of course you have to tell us what it is if you want us to interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar, it's almost like he's going, no, 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 no. You know, if you're really what you say that you are, connected with the gods, able to translate and interpret these messages from the gods, well, then the gods will be happy to tell you what the message was. So if you don't tell me what the dream was and its interpretation, he threatens them as only kings can do, right? That I'm going to tear you limb from limb and I'm going to plow your house into a rubbish heap. That's called a motivator, right? Any of you ever seen that show on TV? What's the name of that thing again that's got the, all the people trying to go through those obstacle courses and they fly into the mud and everything? What's that called? Wipeout? Isn't that right? Well, they've got the motivator a lot of the time. If the person stands there too long, the motivator kicks them in the backside and off they go into the thing, right? Well, this is a motivator that Nebuchadnezzar is using, right? If you don't do this, if you don't tell me what the dream is and its interpretation, you're finished. But there's great reward as well if you do tell me what the dream is, and the interpretation. That's going to give me confidence that you really are in touch with the gods. You really do understand their messages, and I will give you great riches and great stature. So the stakes are laid out there for these guys. It's a credibility test. Very simply, what Nebuchadnezzar says to them, I put it this way in my notes, for the king to trust their interpretation, something he does not know, he tests their knowledge of secret things, something he does know. He knows what the dream is, but it's secret. It's only in his heart right now. So to test them that they can, un they can understand the interpretation, which he doesn't understand, he's going to ask him what the dream was, what he does know. Okay? That's the test out there. So the gods know these types of things. If these wise men are in touch with God, they can get access to the gods, and they can find out. But again, they object, don't they? And I want you to notice this because in verses 10 and 11, look at it again there in chapter 2. This is really where the thing pivots, the story. Because notice what they say. I can just see the wise men getting into whiny mode, can't you? You ever have kids like that? King, king. Can't you see it? Look at what they say. There's not a man on earth who could declare the matter to the king. And then verse 11, look at it. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. There's no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Hang on to that. We're going to come back to that. It leads to the next part. Well, now Daniel comes into the story, right? They come for Daniel. By the way, it appears as though from the timing of this in verse 1 that Daniel and his pals are still in that three-year apprentice process here, that they haven't been fully established as wise men in Babylon, but in training, they're considered to be part of the wise men, and so their lives are on the line as well. And this becomes known to Daniel, and in verses 14 through 18 now, Daniel makes requests. Sounds like last Last time, doesn't it? When he had his requests for the commander of the servants about eating the food and drinking the wine. Well, now this representative of Nebuchadnezzar, Arioch, comes and Daniel says, uh, Can I come see the king and just ask for time so that what's the big rush with this? Uh, let, give us some time and we can, uh, we can appeal to our God about this. And so in verses 14 through 18, they're given extended time. And notice in verses 17 and 18, Daniel goes to his house and he consults with his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And notice what they do, verse 18. They make requests. That's called prayer, folks. 
They make requests and they request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that they won't be killed. So they go before the Lord and they put it before him. And specifically, the author tells us they're seeking God's compassion here so that they won't be killed by Nebuchadnezzar. All right? Well, here comes the really fun part, isn't it? In verses 19 through 23, I put it this way, Daniel's great God answers their request. Isn't that great? Look at it in verse 19. I think this is a literary device here that the author uses to understate the answer. You'd think that after he'd write it something like, after all this prolonged time of prayer and fasting, prostrate before the Lord, cutting themselves to show their sincerity, blah, 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 God answers the request and tells the answer the dream. But notice what it says there. You almost miss it, don't you? In verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. God answered their prayer. He told him what it was. And what's the response? This is something I hope you notice in the rest of the scriptures too. Daniel's response is one of praise and worship, isn't it? In verses 20 through 23, it says that Daniel said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever. And he goes on with this song. It's like a psalm he creates right there in the middle of the narrative. I hope some of you who read your Bibles through and through a lot, you notice this type of thing. When really significant things happen in the Scripture, when God does really important stuff, oftentimes it turns to this type of praise and worship right on the spot, right in the middle of the narrative in the story that there'll be worship and praise. A couple that you might remember that are really fantastic. When God delivers the Israelites from the Egyptians through the Red Sea, remember that in Exodus 14? As soon as they get onto the other side and the armies of Egypt are destroyed, remember Exodus 15? It's worship. Moses leads them. Remember the thing about the horse and his rider? He is cast into the sea. It's a great psalm of worship right on the spot. You go to the New Testament, you see the same thing. When Zechariah and Elizabeth find out that they are pregnant with John the Baptist, look at it, it turns to praise. And then there's a fancy name we call for it when Gabriel comes to Mary and announces to her that she will bear the Messiah. We call it the Magnificat of Mary's worship and praise at that point. So it's almost like that's using a highlighter on this event here to say this is a great thing that has just happened. God has worked powerfully here now to answer their prayer and Daniel recognizes it and it turns to praise. I want you to notice the content of that praise. Daniel blesses God and do you see the things that he singles out in there? He says in verse 20, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever For what belongs to him? You can say it out loud. What is it? Wisdom and power, right? He zeroes in on those two things. For wisdom and power belong to him. And then notice how he gives details of that. You want to understand his power? Verse 21, it's he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He's the one... God has the power. We call that his sovereign power over the earth. Kings rise and they fall because God establishes them and he removes them. That is the power of Almighty God. Think of that in light of the power of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He looks like he's the biggest guy on the block, doesn't he? God could take and squash him under his finger. In fact, we're going to see that in a couple of weeks. Or he almost does that to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar doesn't quite have that straight. So God's power, you bet, blessed forever and ever but because all power belongs to him. And then knowledge, or I'm sorry, wisdom. Look at the rest of verse 21 into verse 22. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. So the wise receive wisdom from God. They don't have it on their own. God gives it to them. 
And those who know, God gives knowledge to. That's literally what it's saying. He gives knowledge to knowers here. Verse 22, he reveals profound and hidden things. His wisdom is such that he knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. That is our God, ladies and gentlemen. All power and all wisdom belong to him, and Daniel recognizes it here with this answer to his prayer. But then notice also in verse 23, he's already said it a little bit, but Daniel makes it perfectly clear in verse 23. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and power by answering our prayer and making this matter known to me so I can go to the king with it. So not only does God have wisdom and power, he gives it to his servants so that they can serve him and the good of his people with that wisdom and power. It's one thing for God to have the wisdom and power. It's another thing for him to give it to Daniel to answer this. He knows the secret things, and he grants those secrets to Daniel. And then one other thing there. Did you notice how he addresses God there in verse 23? To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. It's easy to look right over the top of that. God of my fathers? What fathers? Oh, maybe somebody like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Moses, or David. All God's promises that he has made to this nation and to these people in exile that go back to those fathers. Daniel he knows why God has answered his prayer. Amen. It's because he's promised good protection and care for these people. So it's just an offhanded little comment to us, but I think it's almost the center of Daniel's prayer here because he knows God has covenanted with these people to protect, to guide, and to care for them. He can rejoice that this wisdom has been given to him and this power on the basis of those promises. That's why God has done it. He's promised to take care of them. Okay? So you with me so far? That's Daniel 1 through 23. Got to keep moving here. I'm going to run out of time. Next section, this is when the solution comes, isn't it? In chapter 2, verses 24 through 45. Everybody take a deep breath here, and we're going to read this again. I want to read the whole thing, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more, all right? So pick up the story here in Daniel chapter 2, in verse 24. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went to spoke to him and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me into the king's presence, and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while you were on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed your thoughts turned to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You, O king... We're looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of an extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. 
Then the iron and clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell or the beasts of the field or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hands and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you then another third kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron insomuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks in pieces it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron it will be a divided kingdom but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so that the dream is true. And its interpretation is trustworthy. Whew, wow. What a statement, isn't it? Let's look at this in three or four parts here very briefly. All right? First of all, if you look at verses 24 through 30, this is where Daniel helps clarify what's going on here. The king asks Daniel when he is brought into his presence, do you know the dream and its interpretation? Notice what Daniel's response is, though, in verses 27 through 30, he says, There is a God in heaven who knows these mysteries, and he has made it known to me. In other words, this comes from God. I love the way he describes it in verse 30 there. You see it where he says, This mystery hasn't been revealed to me because of any wisdom or knowledge I have, any greater than any other man. There's nothing special about me there's something very special about my God. He is the one who has done this. It reminds me of Acts chapter 3. Those of you who remember in the New Testament, right after the day of Pentecost, when Peter and John, they healed that man that was crippled there coming into the temple. Remember that? And all the people come out and they're, oh man. Remember what Peter's words were? He says, it's not by some power or might that we have that this man walks today, but it's by the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ that this man stands before you. So these servants have got very clear here to make it crystal clear about what's going on. Me, uh-uh. Him, uh-huh. He is the one making this known, not because of my wisdom and knowledge. So... Before he gives the dream and its interpretation, Daniel wants everybody to understand exactly what's going on here. Don't look to me as some brainiac here that's giving this dream and its interpretation. God is the one who has done this. My God, the God of Israel. Okay? Everybody clear with that? Now here we go. In verses 31 through 35, Daniel reveals to Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. He just describes it for Nebuchadnezzar. Isn't it interesting there's no response of Nebuchadnezzar? I think if I would have been Nebuchadnezzar while he's revealing this dream, I would have been going. <laughs> it's in the secret of his heart, and Daniel's telling him what it is. That's right. This is impressive, isn't it? But there's no response here that's recorded of Nebuchadnezzar in verses 31 through 35. But we see that sometimes it's called a colossus, isn't it? 
where it's all about this statue and this stone or this rock. The statue with the head of gold, and then he goes down through with the body parts all the way down to the toes, and then he talks about this rock or this stone that was cut out without hands and how it destroys this image. And he seems to get it right because Nebuchadnezzar lets him keep talking, right? So now we get the interpretation in verse 36 all the way through 43. I'm sorry, through 45. And we could take some time with this, folks. It is really fun to read students of Daniel and how they try to make sense out of this Colossus. We know a few things for sure. That the head of gold, Daniel tells us, that's Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But then these other great kingdoms that will come and rule over the earth that is not exactly quite as clear. Some of your Bibles may have already given you an interpretation in there with their headings on that. That the next kingdom that he talks about probably was the one of the Medes and the Persians. We learn this later in Daniel that they were the ones who came and overthrew the Babylonians in Babylon and took over this great kingdom. It's possible that who, that's who it's talking about. And then the idea here of Greece being in here with Alexander the Great and his conquest of the earth being predicted as one of these great kingdoms. And then lastly, the Roman Empire itself being the empire of iron. And then the whole thing with the toes of iron and clay mixed together being brittle and yet very strong. Uh, that's, uh, that's all uh, up in the air. I think that it is talking about Rome, but this is highly disputed among interpreters. Daniel really doesn't give us a lot of clarity in the 21st century here now to be able to understand this. But from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, this is spectacular to talk about these four coming kingdoms coming down the line to talk about the future here of what's coming. I want you to notice something. It appears as though these kingdoms become less impressive from the text here, but stronger as they go down successively through the kingdoms. Notice that after the head of gold there, he says that in verse 39, after you, Nebuchadnezzar, there will arise another king, a kingdom inferior to you, and then a third kingdom. So it seems as though they aren't as impressive, just as gold is more impressive than silver and bronze and so forth. The kingdoms aren't as impressive, but they seem, I don't know what would be the right word, more brutal? stronger, uh, the strength of the kingdom of iron especially is emphasized in the verses there in verses 40 through 43. So we could spend the rest of the afternoon here trying to put together the piece of this as far as understanding the prophecy. The force of the impact of this is significant though, isn't it? That he is putting out there for King Nebuchadnezzar the future and to give the king confidence in his dream and what was interpreted or what was revealed to him. The interesting part comes, though, with that rock cut without hands, isn't it? That's where Daniel goes in verses 44 and 45, and he explicitly talks about this as being the kingdom of God being established upon the earth. And in light of that great kingdom that is coming in the future, all of these other kingdoms will be crushed and blown away just like chaff in the wind. This kingdom that the rock represents will not have a successor. It is permanent and in fact, it fills the earth eventually. Now I know all you're smiling at me out there thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God that he has now established. Isn't it nice to have about 2,500 years of history here to be able to put this together on our part? But this is, this is an immense, immensely significant point that he makes here about God. He understands and he knows about all these future kingdoms coming. But compared to this kingdom that the rock will establish, they all are like chaff in the wind. They are temporary. They're insignificant compared to that. There's great strength and permanence in this kingdom of God that will be established. Pretty impressive. We've got to keep moving, though. The result of all this, verses 46 through 49, God is glorified and Daniel's rewarded. Look at it with me again. I'll read it. Verse 46. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon, while Daniel was at the king's court. So the result of this, you could say Nebuchadnezzar is impressed, right? In fact, he is so impressed, he even falls down and is giving offerings to Daniel here. Now, if he understands Daniel, we know that Daniel is saying, it wasn't me, right? But yet, it seems as though this has had a powerful enough impact on Nebuchadnezzar that he's going to pay homage even to God's servant when he's in his presence there. The God of heaven is up there. He can offer to him. But here's Daniel right in front of him, this very powerful ambassador to this God of heaven. So he's going to virtually worship Daniel here at the same time that he commends uh, Daniel's, Daniel's God. He declares God's greatness here as and Daniel is glorified as God's voice and God's representative. And then the chapter ends here with Daniel being promoted to a very high position and now his three friends as well. So Nebuchadnezzar, he has enough insight here himself to realize these men are very valuable. I'm going to put them in a place of influence because of this impressive display of their wisdom and insight to interpret the end, to tell us what this dream was of, of this great Colossus. Okay, that's the story. Let me conclude here this morning with the last few minutes by looking a little bit closer and focusing in on what we can take from this. First of all, there's several things that we learn about God Almighty himself. I don't know about you, this is usually the sweetest and the richest times in the scripture for me when there's greater clarity and revelation given about God himself and who he is. Amen. I'd like to point to several of those with you very briefly here this morning. All right, The first one I put down, we've talked about already, God's power and his wisdom. It's accentuated in verses 19 through 23, but it's also displayed in the rest of the chapter. God's power, yes, he controls. Look at the verbs there again if you need it in Daniel's praise. God changes, he removes, and he sets up. He's in charge. He controls. But he also knows. In verse 22, it's like he is the light in the darkness, the profound and the hidden things are not hidden from him. He knows he's got that great wisdom. So God's power and his wisdom, I'm not going to go any further with that. We've already talked about it. But something you might have overlooked in this also is a second contrast here of who God is that is very important in the way that he deals with the human race and with the universe. Theologians use these two words to describe it, and then I'll try to explain it. I would offer to you that God's transcendence and his imminence are on dis display. And if you spell that word imminence, make sure to spell it right. Imminence with an A, not imminence with an I. Something that's imminent means it's going to happen any second. So the dear brother in row seven, seat four over there, it's imminent that he's going to fall asleep. You know, he's over, <laughs> he's over there. Okay? No, no, no. Not that kind of imminent. Imminent is what we're going to talk about here. All right? First of all, God's transcendence means, though, that he is over his creation and he's separate from it. He is not part of it. This is made clear in Daniel chapter 2 with an expression that I haven't emphasized yet. But did you notice how many times the expression for God is used in Daniel 2 where it calls him the God of heaven? What does that tell you? He is not immersed and subject to the things on the earth. He is the God of heaven. If you need the verses, I've got them here for you. Look at the verses, folks. In verse 18, the expression is used. Again, in verse 19, verse 28, verse 37, and verse 44. The God of heaven. He's transcendent. He is not 
saddled with human affairs. He is over it all. Amen. He is transcendent. He transcends the earth, so he is just as much a part of what's going on here as he is in Bogota, Colombia this morning or in Beijing in China. He is transcendent over the earth. Amen. Glory to God, he's not limited. He's above earthly affairs. But he is also imminent, folks. The word imminency means that he is actively involved with his universe. Even though he is separated, separated from it, he is not uninvolved. He actively engages in his creation and in the human race. And we see that with all the verbs used for him here. He changes things. He removes kings. He sets up other kings. He's actively involved in his creation and in the affairs of human beings. He gives wisdom and knowledge. He reveals mysteries, specifically here to Daniel in this chapter. So it isn't that God stands back as transcendent and says, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I, I got it all. I know exactly what's going to happen, but I'm not telling you. No, he is imminently glorified in this chapter because not only does he have the knowledge of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he gives that knowledge to Daniel so that it saves his life. That's the force of Daniel's praise psalm there, remember? You, O Lord, have the wisdom and the power, and you, O Lord, God of my fathers, you have given me wisdom and power to understand the king's dream. So not only does he have it, he is imminently involved to give it so that we can benefit from it and his glory can be achieved. He has the power and the wisdom and he gives it. This is precisely what's going on back there in verse 11. Look at it again if you need to. Remember that objection of the wise men to Nebuchadnezzar insisting upon them telling them what the dream is? Let me read it again. This is the wise men again speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and they say, Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. There is no one else who would declare it to the king except God's, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. The only one that knows what your dream is is the God's, but they don't dwell with us. Well, the chapter's response to that is, oh yes, they do. We have an imminent God who does give us that kind of knowledge and insight and wisdom. Think about how frustrating it would be for us, ladies and gentlemen, if we knew we had a glorious, transcendent, all-powerful, all-knowing God who didn't share it with us. And let us just blindly stagger around in the darkness. It's awesome. He is imminent. And remember, he's imminently involved with these people because he's promised to. Remember that? God of our fathers. He has promised to act on Daniel and the people's behalf. So God's transcendence, his imminence. What does this mean then? Living as God's servants, as servants of the living God. If this transcendent, sovereign, wise God uh, uh, rules the affairs of humans, then how should we act? How should we live as his followers, as his servants? I'd offer you two or three things. First of all, that we live with great faith and trust in this God and we do not despair. That it is the same God that has worked powerfully through the centuries, epitomized here in Daniel chapter 2 today. He is the same transcendent, imminent God who has promised us through the Lord Jesus Christ the same type of protection, guidance, and care because of his loyal love. Amen. And the challenge for us is to put our trust in that. Y'all remember Corey Ten Boom's story in The Hiding Place? I love the song that came out of that. Whenever I feel afraid, what will I do? I will trust in you. This is a life-threatening situation here for Daniel and his friends. And he casts himself upon God here. Not despair, but faith 
We're in God's hands. We trust God no matter what. doesn't matter how uncertain the times are. Anybody a little spooked by the uncertain times we live in? Politically, socially, economically, many Christians are getting ulcers. It's a great challenge for me. I think for my wife and me, we talk about this a lot, about trusting God in the midst of what could be anxiety. We trust him. Secondly, I would also challenge you that I didn't get to talk to this too much about with Daniel, but it also challenges us to be humble and not presumptuous Amen. in God's working on our behalf. That God is free to act. This is revealed for us in verse 18 of chapter 2 there, where Daniel and his three friends, they go before God in prayer seeking his compassion. Compassion, folks, is when God shows us his mercy and his kindness when he doesn't have to. Amen. If compassion isn't freely given, it's not compassion at all. It's obligation. And God is not obligated. He has the freedom to act, and Daniel recognizes this. They seek God's compassion here. Perhaps God will be good and deliver them from the king's edict here. I want to talk about this much more next week with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they illustrate it as well. Not to presume on God's answering prayer the way we think or we know that he's going to do it. Not presuming on God's actions. Because step back for a minute from our lives, folks. This with Daniel and with us as well in 2013, it's all about God and his purposes. It's not just about us and our needs. Our needs and our wants are part of that, but a small part. It's all about God's purposes being worked out to his glory. Think of the way Jesus modeled this for us in the garden. Take this cup away from me, Lord. But remember what he said next? Yet not my will, but yours be done. He did not insist upon his own way great model to us. And then lastly, I'm out of time. We also, folks, are challenged here to proclaim God's revelation, to declare his word with boldness, glorifying God, not ourselves. We may not gain insight to dreams, but we've got a whole book of God speaking to us that we can declare. Amen. And I would offer to you that we have a world that needs it more desperately today than ever. For us to speak up boldly and to declare his word with great kindness and love and care, but to declare it to glorify God and not ourselves. In Daniel's praise psalm, he praises God. When Daniel declares the truth of the mystery to Nebuchadnezzar, he glorifies God doing it, not himself. And even the king recognizes it at the end. I wish I had a little more time, but I'm going to stop here. Let's pray. We do thank you, the God of our fathers, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we can rest in and trust and depend upon you for the promises that you've given us. Thank you for this example of Daniel so long ago. Help us to learn and to follow in his steps, God, to trust you and to declare your goodness when you make it known to us. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.